It's a new day, and with cautious optimism, we rise once more, setting forth on a new and different journey. I'm Jeff Oppenheim, filmmaker, content creator, digital journalist, and storyteller. Join me for tomorrow's journey. Today, I travel down a road, both literally and proverbially, one that is divided by nothing more than color, or more specifically, misconceptions. Our destination? The playgrounds of my childhood in a black and white city. Come on and join me. Racial inequalities have long been an issue in this country, certainly throughout all of my years, but they have been laid bare ever the more as of late, and laden with hate. Don't worry, this white boy is not going to start spitting rhymes. And I got to thinking, you know, I've lived a pretty privileged life, and not for obvious reasons, as you might think, but more specifically, simply the life I've got to live, when I got to live it, and where I got to live it, and how that afforded me the collective cultural resources that I was exposed to. And, speaking of cultural resources, as we are coming to the close of this, the shortest month of the year, say no more, I decided to travel back to my own age of innocence. Well, if y'all can imagine anyone describing their childhood in NYC that way. Because I wanted to understand why I innately believe matters of black lives mattered to me. My own journey as a native New Yorker begins at Doctor's Hospital. Well, on the site that was Doctor's Hospital, it's now a swanky condo where you can purchase this lovely apartment hmm, for a mere 5.4 million. Wait, did I get all the zeros there? The story that my father liked to tease me with was that when he was presented with this adorable but bald white baby, my father rocked a curly-haired fro at the time, so he looked around the ward at all the other babies, mostly black and Latino kids, born with practically a full head of hair already, and then he looked at this bald-headed baby, though cute, that the nurse was holding up and said, Can it be mine? Apparently, the moral of this story is that storytelling is more hereditary than hairline. Somehow, I guess my mom talked him into taking me home. To here, Chelsea in the meatpacking district of New York City. No, no, no. Not your millennial meatpacking trendy brasserie chic of today. No, this area was less gay and more gray back then. In fact, that's probably the most white bread my childhood gets. The mere fact that the first apartment I lived in was here on Ninth Avenue, the home of the original bakery for Samuel Bath Thomas. Why is that so delicious to know? That's the guy who invented English muffins. Believe it or not, they were once baked fresh and delivered to grocery stores and hotels that way. But we were only there for my infancy, because apparently we got a real sweet deal on a super spacious two-bedroom, one-bath apartment on 16th off of 9th Avenue. The price, according to my mom, $75 per month. Wait, did I miss a zero? Robert Fulton Housing Project, AKA, for those of you in the know, just the projects. It's a 6.27 acre development with 945 apartments spread out over 11 buildings. Perched here on the 12th floor, this was the neighborhood I would look out on for the formative years of my childhood. The mix was mostly Latino, Puerto Ricano specifically, which is probably why I still listen to and dance to salsa. Black families too, of course, including the Wayan brothers. Wait, or were they just a couple of white chicks? Hmm. And whites, of course. In this case, meaning Irish working the docks and the Italians working the meatpacking. That's why they called that neighborhood that. And then you had me. My own little ethnic melting pot. A quarter of this and a quarter of that. And adopted or welcomed by all the other quarters that I was not. Uh-oh, he's rhyming again. I still claim to be a Puerto Rican, which is my own term for any New Yorker that's a quarter of everything, like me. And, to answer the obvious question on everybody's mind, even if unspoken, did you stick out? Well, yes, this toe-headed then, blue-eyed kid did stick out. But that was cool. My hair became sort of a good luck charm. Black folks often patting my hair, Latino men and women petting it. And other than one time I remember these two older Spanish men arguing over whether I was a boy or a girl simply because I chose to wear my hair long. I mean, it was the 60s and 70s, come on. I never took offense. And in fact, I found 
that it kind of works some magic charms in the Latina mommies behind the bakery counter. Tu quieres un cookie? That was one of the pleasures of the mix. The smells and flavors, inclusive of the sour, sweet, dirty smell of the streets, our collective playground during the hot city summer. Stickball, stoop ball, scully, ring Olivio, kick the can. Hey, drop me a line if you remember the rules to scully here in the comments section. And on the hottest of summer days, you had the open fire hydrant. You add in an old coffee can with holes punched in it, place that over there, sprinkler, cooling you down, a fun afternoon uninterrupted, well, at least until the ice cream truck rolled around. Uh, it was the perfect afternoon, but we also had one other escape in that neighborhood, and this is in a day, keep in mind, when we had no air conditioning. Yes, American kids, there was such a time. We had the piers. On those days, you headed over to the old West Side piers, just a few blocks from my buildings where there always was a breeze. They smelled of a mix of tar, a bay-like smell then from the polluted Hudson. And in certain places, it reeked of activities from the night before. You know, far different games were played there well before Chelsea piers came along. But here's the thing. I grew up playfully saying that I thought most good-looking black men wore high heels at night because most of the drag queens were these solidly built black men, absolutely gorgeous in their silks and lingerie, but even they looked out over the neighborhood. Even they looked out for us youngin'. I remember one even said, Sugar, don't you let no one ever touch you wrong. It was, well, not your typical upbringing in that regard, but it was safe, patrolled at night by the drag queens and by the days by the abuelitos with the pillows in the window watching everything and everybody. Unlike some whisked away suburban fantasy where all the rawness and drugs are just hidden away. But in my neighborhood, it was here. There was weed and beer. And it, sometimes it was a little bit queer. <laughs> But you know what? I woke up every day in a light-filled apartment filled with love and laughter and good neighbors. Right next door to me and my mom were Joyce and Jimmy Hunter. They had two girls, similar to my age. And my mom and Joyce were like, Well, kids, imagine a show on Nick at Night where Mary Tyler Moore from the Mary Tyler Moore Show... No, that's Joan, not Mary. And Diane Carroll from the TV show Julia. That's Diane lived and hung out together. Also on the show of Jeff's youth was the Cantaleses, who were like a Latino partridge family. And then there were the Manellas in the next building over, where Jeff played with all five kids, Robert and Heather, on either side of him. And I also had books, lots of them, not only my own, but those of my mom and dad's. Those were mostly plays, and they were all available to me. Plus, New York City had so many activities back then, many of them free, and all just a subway ride away. But in our own neighborhood, you know, we had so much to offer there. The local community center that was part of the projects themselves and also part of the whole concept of public housing. My mom and dad made good use of those, organizing everything from children's story hours to an evening that I remember still to this day. Ruby D and Ozzie Davis reading Langston Hughes's poetry. Make a garland of Leontine and Lena's and hang it about your neck like a lay. Make a crown of Sammy's, Sidney's, Harry's, Cassius, Muhammad, Ali, Clay. Put their laurels on your brow today. And then before you can walk to the neighborhood corner, watch them droop, wilt, fade away. The Hudson Guild Center was another cultural resource of richness in an otherwise poor neighborhood, and they're still doing great work. But I remember hearing a live performance offered by a tall, solid, black, classically trained singer with the most remarkable basso voice. Rolling 
His name was William Warfield, and he was a gifted and talented singer with an illustrious career, and actually for a short time married to another incredible artist, Leotine Price, who I got to hear. If you know your opera, you'll know who she is. But that evening, as a young child, I got to listen to him present a night of Negro spirituals and ballads that I still remember to this day. It was extraordinary in all for this 150 seat theater in the community for the price of three bucks. Wait, I must have missed a zero there for sure. Little did I suppose that the musical showboat from which the song Old Man River is from, having thus entered my life, would weave throughout it. But the magic of performance and its allure would actually eventually bring me to the allure of magic. When a magician by the name of, I think, Frank Benson came to my school, PS11, and performed magic for me and my classmates, which were a rainbow of diversity unto themselves. And I was awestruck. So much so that I got the gumption to walk up to him after the show and ask him how I too could learn how to do the incredible tricks he did. And the man, tall, strong, slightly gray in afro, leaned over to me and said, well, get a hold of every book you can in the library, kid. It has something to do with magic. And you know what? In that, I realized he did two things that day, influencing me forever. One, he got me hooked on magic, which I'm still a sucker for. But two, he introduced a young man to the magic of reading. As I revisit my childhood walking around this area, I am often pulled up short from my memories by the surreal sight of new development. Modern glass and steel buildings going up Opposite places like the site of the old boondocks bar and restaurant. Now an upscale pizzeria, but back then it was a sawdust-strewn oasis that served soul food while live jazz permeated above the din of the street noise. I remember sitting at one of the tables one night right alongside where the musicians were playing. A black blind bassist asked if he could put his drink on the table, our table. He told me he was putting me in charge of it, too. <laughs> he teased me, too, saying, don't go drinking it all on me now, kid. And you know what, in that moment, he made me feel welcome, as if I should be no other place than right there. And at that moment, I was anchored on him. I could see his fingers dance almost absent-mindedly over the strings of an instrument <laughs> bigger than me. In fact, he and his bass, oh, they were larger than life. Seems we got ourselves a young jazz ambassador in the house tonight, he said to me. The deep vibrato of his voice still resonates with me today, and did so as I walk around the streets of my old neighborhood, Chelsea and the Meatpacking District. Looking back on these memories of why, I guess, I felt so attached, included, involved. I mean, Mr. Jazz Guy made me the ambassador for the night told this kid he was right where he belonged. Mr. Warfield brought us all into the incredible world of the Negro spiritual, giving us not only the passion, but the deep, rich history that it represents. And then Ruby D and Ozzy Davis, playing off each other as husband and wife and sublime first lady and first gentleman of black theater, certainly, telling us, sharing us, the words of Langston Hughes in a city that he came to love just like we did. And then, of course, my very own magician mentor, Frank, producing a colorful rainbow out of scarves into an umbrella of as many colors as was represented in that school auditorium that day. Now, I don't want to over-romanticize my childhood because it's certainly no hallmark idyllic, for sure. But even as I walked my old streets once more, and did notice that the projects were being run into the ground for the residents that still live there, and in fact even learned from one resident that the city has been in talks with real estate developers who will no doubt come in there and make drastic changes because they only see but one color, green. No doubt things will change there. 
and I'm not too sure for better or for worse, but at least back in the day, in a city of gray, through these blue eyes, I got to see not only black lives, lives of color, lives in general, all working together, coming together, trying to carve out a life of decency as a community, were and still is something that shapes my perspective. I know I have been invited in before and with an open heart, I'll continue to be invited in. I will continue to celebrate the collective cultural contributions and history that our brothers and sisters bring to the table every day, well beyond the confines of the shortest month of the year. I'm Jeff Oppenheim, and I thank you for joining my community on YouTube. And I hope you'll be an active member by liking, sharing, commenting, sharing an experience for that matter in the comments section of your own childhood that may be similar or dissimilar to mine. But until the next time, I want to thank you for joining me and I encourage you to stay safe, stay well, but stay connected.